Wilma, um, Ms. Wilma Quaterno is the chief of the Crop Pest Management Division at the Bureau of Plant Industry, BPI, uh, uh, under the Department of Agriculture in the Philippines. Wilma has 41 years of, of service and over all those years she has gained ample experience in wildlife management, IPM, farmer field schools and overall crop protection. Yes. So there are about 2.5 million hectares of corn fields in the Philippines and they are planted to often pollinated variety, conventional hybrid and genetically modified varieties. The open pollinated varieties and conventional varieties are usually used for food, while the genetically modified varieties are for processing and for feeds. The first observation of POW in the Philippines was in the northern part of Luzon Island. So that, uh, that field was planted to mix conventional hybrid and genetically modified varieties, about 100 hectares. After four months of observation, all 16 regions of the country reported its presence in their respective area. So the initial result of molecular analysis showed the presence of corn and rice strain. But the most affected crop is corn. Though there are some observations on sugar cane and sorghum, but that those did not prosper. Next slide, please. So this is now our National Action Plan for the Sustainable Management of the FAO, Fall Army Worm. So in this National Action Plan, all stakeholders are involved from farmers to local government to national government, then from private and public groups and individuals. So next slide, please. Uh, okay, this one. So we have to, is this the first one please? Or... <laughs> so we have to prepare, the... no, the first one, the third slide, I think. So we have to prepare preemptive measures to avoid and prevent occurrence and spread of foul. So these preemptive measures can be through ICTs, through brochures, infographics, through awareness trainings and meetings and issuance of pest advisories or quarantine ordinance. So we have to empower our farmers also, and that is a must because they are the frontliners in the battle against fall army worm. Most of our corn farmers have small land holdings. So identifying high risk areas and hot spots is necessary for us for the wise use of our resources. And we will know also what to prepare and all the activities will be planned for a common goal. Next, please. Oh. So we will be training our farmers for early detection and surveillance and also management. And as well as the local technicians to assess the infestation and damage. We are also planning to coordinate with our respective state universities in the regions for them to help in the assessment and validation of some uh, data. So they can help and assist our local technicians. So we have initially prepared contingency measures uh, on how to handle outbreaks, but this, these are all based on literature and uh, I think we need to validate them. And the objective for us is to have location and pest status specific IPM package of technology. So trainings of both farmers and technicians will be continuing based on new findings from scientists research, local technician observation, farmers observation and research through participatory action research with farmers and local technicians. Next slide, please. So for our holistic approach, we need to engage and coordinate with our stakeholders. The secretary of the Department of Agriculture has organized the crisis management team in the Department of Agriculture. So we can invite 
all those concerned departments for your regular meetings, actually we had already meetings with them. Then we need to undertake research also for development. I said not conduct research and development, but the word of our secretary is conduct research for development of IPM technology. So which means IPM technology profile must be dynamic. It must evolve until we have the appropriate package for each and every situation in managing the full army worm. So this is also in preparation for other pests and diseases that may come in the country. Next, please. So we have the core strategies and we are using PAMS. We have prevention and avoidance. Then for monitoring, where we have early detection and surveillance. Next, please. Next slide, please. So we, for suppression, we have early infestations in localized and small areas, and we have outbreaks in large areas. Then we have research and development. Next, please. So the sustainability measures are capacity building and networking, and I will discuss this uh, in details in the next slides. Next slide, please. So for prevention and avoidance, we will do FAO awareness campaign. So we will have dissemination of FAO information through meetings, caravans, and other multimedia platforms. We are also issuing pest advisory. So we are issuing pest advisory before the season and also during the season. And we had also some quarantine ordinance that some, especially before the, we have observed the fall RV worm in the Philippines, we have a strict enforcement of plant quarantine regulation and orders for all corns uh, uh, going to and from other islands in the Philippines. Next, please. So we will do also crop diversification although some are doing it already, but still we need some, some more data so that we will know what kind of varieties are we going to plant. So we will be intercropping, we will have relay cropping, we will have sequential or alternate cropping and multiple cropping. So we are practicing this one also, synchronous planting. So under synchronous planting, we have zoning or clustering of areas into different risk of pest outbreaks and simultaneous or closed season planting wherein everyone in an area will have a common season on, on when to end the planting so that the age of the plants, the corn plants in that area is almost the same. Because the fall army war feeds, uh, they are taken people mostly during the early part or the early month. First month is, you can see really the high population of fall army war. Then we will be, we are doing this also field sanitation, the clean culture practices, but we want to validate also what kind and how to, how to clean it thoroughly without leaving any weeds or with some weeds or so we will be validating that. Next please. So for monitoring, we have early detection. So we will be using trap crops. Uh, this will be under validation also, planting of trap crops, legumes for 20 days before the main crops planting. So we will do also some observ observations like uh, looking for frost, egg masses, larvae, adults in initial damage symptoms following FAO protocols. And we are using pest attractants, use of organic baits. Uh, these are from the farmers, and also we are using now commercial pheromones and lures. Next, please. For monitoring under surveillance, this is after detection, we will have surveillance. So we propose that we will identify hotspots because in the hotspots, uh, we learn that for open pollinated variety, uh, you can see more, more larvae. So we will prioritize conduct of surveys in open pollinated variety areas and in early or seedling vegetative stages of crops. So from there, we will check the presence of uh, uh, fowl frass, egg masses, larvae, adults, and initial damage following FAO protocols. Then we will validate also the presence and degree of damage using FAO protocols. So I hope we can come up also with our own 
Next slide, please. Then for suppression, for early POW infestations, we will use physical methods like uh, manual erad eradication where we are crossing the larva. Our secretary uh, named that as tericide because in, in Filipino, tiris is to crush. So we call it tericide. Then the use of sand or as application on corn roll. And we will do also, we are not yet, we will try this one, incentivize collection of larva, wherein some number of larva will be exchanged for some, for especially, for example, one kilo of rice for one kilo of larvae, like that. It's not yet tested, not yet tested but I think we will test that. Then for biological control, we are already releasing VCAs like Metaritium, Trichogramma, Euberia, earwigs. And earwigs is the most common one because it's easy to mass produce. And we have also uh, pesticide, uh, uh, pesticide spraying. So, but we do this, uh, we do this pesticide application through provision to the farmers and spot application of organic and chemical pesticides. Next, please. Then for research and development, at present we are conducting basic research. The academy are doing basic research while the DA uh, research centers are doing the applied research. Next, please. So for sustainability, so we will be doing farmer empowerment by training of trainers. We will do this. We will start this in November. The Agricultural Training Institute has a schedule already, I think, three training of trainers for technicians. And we will do farmer field schools in POW ITM for farmers. Uh, we have already a pilot for this from our from joining the, the FAO projects. And we will conduct also farmer field days. Then we will do also some infographics with the Agricultural Training Institute and distribute this in their, in their centers for farmers. Then the, through the uh, Agricultural Training Institute also, we will look for best practices on fowl management, including indigenous knowledge. And we will have a FAO information database. This is uh, located here at the Bureau of Plant Industry. Next, please. So this one, the last one, the networking is the most important. Uh, we will link the all stakeholders in the country. It will strengthen our package of IPM technology, specific, especially for special locations, depending on FAO stock. And also, we will link with international uh, stakeholders because linking with other stakeholders, like generation of knowledge from a common database in a region, for us, for example, ASEAN, will strengthen our action against fall army war. And I think this is also a preparation for any pest diseases that may come into the region. So I think that's all for power management strategies. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. I hope I was able to manage my time. Thank you very thank you. much, uh, Wilma. Very good presentation. Now we'll move to the second presenter from the Philippines, uh, who is uh, Ivan James Pintkosan, uh, Pint, Pintko Kasan. Uh, who is an agriculturalist with the Department of Agriculture in its regional field office number 12 in the Philippines. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good morning. So my presentation is the continuation of the uh, Mab Welma presently. So we uh, this uh, continuation of the, the status and innovation of uh, POW and IPM and biological control in Asia. So particularly here in the Philippines in uh, region 12, so these are the activities we are undertaken. Uh, we are conducting two batches of three-day training workshop on the biology and ecology of all armyworm uh, and sustainable management strategy. So the output, the output of the activities 
are on the discussion and field work. So the participants know uh, life cycle and origins of preferred developmental condition, which is the discussion. And then the identify, recognize space and its behavior and differentiate from other phase. So these are uh, field works uh, that the participants were going to fill and collect different uh, phase and armyworms so that they can uh, differentiate it. So another one is to know how to carry out regular field surveillance and monitoring. So as you can see this uh, figure, the developmental growth stages of the form are, we must emphasize this for the, uh, we are uh, emphasizes that the monitoring are based on the developmental growth stages of uh, the form. So uh, the, the, uh, the, the monitor must early as, uh, as early as uh, seven days after uh, planting or B2. So these are the critical stages that we must monitor that we are emphasizing to the participants. So another one is to familiar with base management strategies for sustainable management of the old army worm, which is the IPM farms. So here are the other ones, the, we use the uh, light trap that is solar powered UV light trap or LED and then the pheromone to, uh, to monitor the presence of adult fowl or the fall army worm. So for the other management strategies options to sustain manage, uh, management of the fall army worm, which is the biocontrol associated with the fall army worm. So, uh, and then the use of local control as promising management, like uh, the sugar, ash, soil, sand, botanical so uh, soaps, wood ash. These are for the confirmatories in the farmer's field school. So second, they conduct a five-day training appraisal workshop for the PAO IPM FFS facilitator on the sustainable management. So the objectives uh, of the appraisal training workshop are to provide uh, additional knowledge and skills specifically on the sustainable management of the whole army worm. So the output of the five-day uh, five uh, appraisal training course and the field works, uh, like uh, the other uh, previous uh, slides, uh, the participants are, uh, we discussed the biology and ecology of the whole army worm so that they could recognize the different stages of the whole army worm and understand the implication. So the biology, ecology, and the surveillance of the face. So here, the picture, uh, the uh, participants are IEWs, the agricultural extension workers, that they are in the field to collect different stages of the whole army worm. So for the management option, understanding basic uh, IPM principle, so the prevention, avoidance, so they also, they, they, they have uh, exercises in the field at night. So they are solar powered, 15 watts ultraviolet to, uh, to monitor the presence of the, uh, both adult male and female of whole army worm, and then the mercury vapor bulb that is 1000. So these are, uh, for this 1000 is so very expensive at, at, uh, to use. Uh, unlike this uh, solar power lead uh, that is uh, less expensive. So for the community action for pole army worm, for design most suitable field studies, this is an uh, ongoing activities as to, uh, today. So they, they use uh, local control as promising management option. The, so, uh, the soil as, so these are uh, like what I've said that the, these are the confirmatory in the uh, Farmers Field School as of uh, today. So for the community, uh, other community actions like the solar trap, uh, as what you can see the, here in the graph of the solar light trap that the first few days, uh, they uh, caught adult, both male and female of pole army worm is in high. So first few days, then up to, these are uh, 26 days. And then uh, after uh, 15 days, the the, the graph are goes down. So that means that the, uh, the that might be the uh, uh, reduce the population or cuts the uh, adult pole army worm. So an, another uh, uh, for the community is the FEOW scouting pattern to assist field infestation. So uh, for the third activities that we are conducted are the two batches of the three day training workshop for the Bantai PSD and local farmers uh, and technicians on uh, so power surveillance and monitoring system. So the output of this uh, discussion of the uh, activities and the field works are, uh, we uh, they also know the life cycle and developmental condition for the discussion and to and, uh, identify, recognize pace, behavior and differentiate from other pace and local army. So these are uh, field works for identification. 
And for to know how to carry a regular field surveillance and monitoring, we are emphasizing that the the, the, the monitoring is um, uh, is uh, uh, important in this uh, uh, situation. So, uh, like the uh, light trap, we can use that as a monitoring tool. And then for the scouting for the infested area, we are we are recommend to use the double pattern to assess the area of the community. And then for the pheromone, so we can uh, attract the both male and uh, for uh, male uh, male mode. So another is the, to familiar with best management strategies and options for the sustainable management of all army work or the farms. So these are particular on, on the local uh, practici uh, practices that we are now uh, ongoing in the APTS assessment. So other activities we are inducted is the uh, uh, biocon associated with POW. So these activities are in uh, uh, zoo uh, or the in sick zoo so, so that uh, the, uh, we can identify and monitor what is the potential or the presence on the uh, pest. Like for example, the egg parasitoid that we are uh, 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 see that the telenomos are uh, can able to parasitize the uh, pole armyworm eggs, the predatory beetle for small larvae of the pole armyworm and the earwigs. So other activities undertaken is the exercise of hazard uh, pesticides. So the applicator is uh, wearing white crepe paper to trace where where they can uh, uh, contaminate the pesticides in their body, not just only in their body, but the environment as well. So the response of uh, other activities is the response of uh, different stages of uh, pole armyworm larva to different kinds. These are hands-on activity so that the participants know that the uh, that the pole armyworm larvae can uh, react or respond. So these are the participants observed 15 to 30 or 45 minutes up to 60 minutes. So what will happen the larva after that uh, minute? So they, they can observe is if there is a mortality. So they, that is a record for their uh, uh, hands-on. So they are uh, participants application insecticide at two different uh, fog larvae. So to date, the status of farmers field school for the participated technology development in a pole army worm IPM. So the five pilot site located in uh, South Cotabato, Philippines here in the region 12. So the Santo Nino, Corona del City, Tampacan, Tibuli, and Surala. These are the five FFS pilot sites uh, that we are uh, conducting uh, a farmers field school. So for the uh, FEO, farmers field school IPM update, uh, like here, the, the Santo Nino, are, they are planted last October, so October 6, and then the field size of their APS is an, uh, one hectare. So every Thursday, they are made for their uh, classes. So they are conducted uh, ISA 1 as of uh, uh, last week. So uh, yesterday, when I called uh, uh, the uh, other uh, uh, IPM coordinator, they are conducted uh uh their isa uh three so as we can see other like this uh surala is not yet uh planted they are in the stage of plant preparation so tentatively or to date maybe they they are uh planting to date uh then yesterday the here in sitio uh tibuli or the tibuli uh municipality they are uh, planting yesterday we are uh, we are there when uh, they are layouting their fields and uh, planting. So here are the uh, Farmers Field School PTD uh, design or the layout. So as what we can see here, the conventional hybrid, the OPB, the glutinous, and the sweet corn varieties are these are the uh, interest in our uh, field uh, studies. So the treatment of, like for example, the conventional hybrid is the they are the treatment that farmers practice the IPM and organic. So uh, as well as the OPB, uh, we are, uh, uh, the treatment is the farmers practice, IPM and organic. So what is that? So this, uh, these treatments are the different options developed by the group during a refreezer course. So the, DPD, uh, the PTD will showcase the indigenous practices of the farmers as a result of the monitoring. So like, for example, the farmers practice, they can apply or they could apply uh, local practices 
on based on their, the result of the survey or mostly these practices are pesticides used. So for the organic, these are the as sun, soil, and waters and uh, wood vinegar. And that application is here and there. Uh, 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 the application is uh, here, there. For the concoction or the, uh, for these uh, treatments, these are the list of the, or these are the options, the fermented juice, uh, the fermented plant juice, the cheese amino or the oriental herb nutrient. For the IPM, we use that the application treatments based on the result of the monitoring or these are the metarisium, anisuple, the nuclear uh, polyhedrosis virus or the NPD, and then the trichogramma was, as well as the telenomos, the botanical pesticides, and then the uh, detergent soap. For the uh, Ivan, of the Ivan yes. just, a, just a quick note from me. Uh, we will have to move forward with the next uh, talk soon. So if you can summarize some of your last slides, that would be great. Uh, I think that is an uh, last two slides, sir. Oh, okay, very good, excellent. Uh, yes, sir. yes, that, that is this. These are the package of technology. So, I that is that's it. That that will end my presentation, sir. Thank you. Okay, oh, very good. Now we go to India, and we go to Dr. N. Bhaktafa. Bhakta Vatsalam. Um, uh, he's the director of the ICAR National Bureau of Agricultural Insect Resources. He has over 35 years of experience on insect pest management on diversified crops. He's an expert in chemical ecology and biological control with over 10 patents to his credit on the attraction and repellent formulation uh, for various insect pests. He has over 150 publications in reputed journals, symposium papers, and book chapters. And he's the recipient of uh, the B DBT Birak Award for the mating disruption of insects using pheromones. So let's see if we can get uh, Dr. Bak Bakta Vatsalam uh, connected. Let's see. Good, good afternoon, Dr. Uh, Chris. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Can we hear you? Yes, uh, Dr. Marut, uh, Dr. Hoodie, I know him. Earlier also, I was with him in one of the presentations. Dr. Allison, also, I was there in the last presentation. Uh, I think we had in uh, August. Uh, Dr. Wilma and other participants who are locked to the, into this program webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. I am sharing my slide. Yeah, you can share your slide. Uh, that, that's probably easiest. So I will be mostly dealing with the biointensive management uh, since we work on a non-pesticidal approach. So we, our thrust is mostly on the uh, non-insecticidal approach, mainly on the biological control. So uh, uh, all these people have contributed. This is my team. So India, the corn production is almost like uh, uh, we have 9.4 million hectares and is, we are producing almost like 27.5 million tons and our productivity is a little low. It is only 3.12 uh, tons per hectare. Uh, this is the third major cereal and we grow uh, maize in two, two seasons. One is uh, called the curry that is between June and July and another is in the rabi. And of course, in the yield in the rabi, that is the winter sowing in the October, is always very high compared to the sowing in June or July. So this is the consumption pattern of maize in India. So mainly it goes almost like 47%. It goes to uh, poultry. And again, uh, about 20% it is for the direct consumption. And uh, uh, another other areas, this is uh, the pattern of consumption. So fall armyworm from probably from Africa, it entered in 2018. And uh, uh, initially it was noticed uh, in, in, in this area. Of course, uh, within a span of maybe uh, a few months, uh, it has spread almost like all the area in India. Only this area is now left out. Even here, we have observed this is called Himachal Pradesh. And initially we noticed this on the maize, later it shifted to sorghum. 
and occasionally there are reports it is feeding on sugar cane and uh, sometimes there are also calf damage also is noticed so earlier in 2018 we found the damage up to 70% of plant damage but now drastically it has come down uh, maybe because of the initiatives taken by our government so now it is almost 20 to 30% but even what i feel is wherever the new infestation are there the infestation is very high even up to 70 70% it is going and uh, of course we always say don't worry about it because it has uh, india has a good number of natural enemies to control of course i i think we, i know don't need any uh, introduction for this this is only to show it is also causing uh, damage to uh, sargam and also sometimes we see the damage to the crops also so uh, of course india is blessed with a good number of natural enemies as i told you this is the telenomus the egg parasitoid uh, this is actually exotic it is imported in 1964 and uh, this has uh, initially imported for litura but after litura but it has started feeding uh, 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 diversifying into sodapra fergipoda also so again uh, this trichogramma we have two three species one is the kailoni species uh, and other is uh, the pretiosum pretiosum is uh, Uh, imported one this was also adapted to this and we have egg larval parasitoids kilonis species kilomenes formosinus this is also a leg larval uh, parasitoids we have cassidigium transficosum this is actually a, a, a pest endoparasitoid which has uh, reported on several uh, 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 lepidopteran pest and coccidium we found very good numbers so some places even in uh, Andhra Pradesh, and uh, which is little above us, we got a parasitation up to fifty percent by this uh, parasitoid Coccidium, uh, and uh, again it is a larval parasitoid. And uh, again we have the uh, Cotyxia uh, rufricus. This is uh, basically it was reported in Mithimna, but again we found it is adapted to Spora prafergipoda. This is just to show you the Telenomus and Trichogrammus, and again. Uh, uh, Glyptantelus. This is a, a general parasitoid, which we found out is an ectoparasitoid on most of the noctuids. But we also found this is adapted to Fergipoda. Uh, Campylotus chloridae, which we have already, it is a uh, Echinomonas larval parasitoid, which is both uh, Echino, uh, uh, which are we used to get it in Spodapra, Litura as well as uh, Helicorpa. But now we observed this has also come to. Uh, so, Dr. Farji Pada, and uh, again, Phanerotoma on this larval parasitoid also we have very good numbers. Uh, so, uh, so these are other uh, predators. Uh, uh, this is the our uh, earwig, Farficulla, and again, Coccinellids. So, so generally we make surveys, and this is uh, the cavy representative in India, Dr. Malvika, who was also with us. so what we have observed is a natural uh, parasitism parasitism in southern india is uh, in 18 19 by trichogramma it is up to 12% now we found it is increased to 14% again the telenomus we have observed up to 11% in, uh, in 1920 and the even larval parasitoid kilonus species we have found the initially it was only up to 1.4% and now it has come up to 20% so in northeast that is uh, the northeast part which is adjoining the china and nepal and uh, burma uh, myanmar so we found uh, very good parasitization or infection up to 73% by the uh, either the parasitoids or by the entomo pathogens so these are the three egg parasitoids which we are mentioning and fortunately uh, the de development rearing technologies we have already standardized so uh, trichogramma kilonis and pretiosum we uh, rear it on the carcera cephalonica which is very easy and uh, of course we have the capacity to produce up to 50 cards per uh, day and uh, again uh, uh, so this uh, uh, each card will have almost like 16000 numbers of uh, parasitoids x which will be cut into 16 pieces and uh, it is trapped on the fields uh, on the underside of the uh, uh, leaf and again telinamus ramus uh, we keep almost like uh, our cap capacity is uh, almost 6000 and we are also um, producing on the ex of spodaptera litura 
the quality of telinamus and trichogramma is very good we get almost like 90% emergence in the field so this we have done and again uh, we have always conserving this uh, parasites we have very good repository and live repository here all these parasites are very effectively conserved in our ex situ conservation technologies so this is the again the kilonis uh, formosinus this is an egg larval parasite so so as i told you the uh, pentatomid predators andrelus this is a general predator and again yocanthicona also is uh, feeding on uh, this one so this andrelus is uh, known to be a predator on helicopterpodoptera and even uh, uh, other species of lepidopterans but now we have found this as adapted to this and again it was mentioned in different uh, the lectures that earwigs earwigs also is uh, natural predation we have observed in the field so this is another uh, one uh, this is uh, actually this is the uh, parasitoids on the eggs of mantids and the spiders but we found this also as adapted and we observed this uh, pupae of uh, uh, our uh, uh, spodopra fergipeda is parasitoid but the pseudogarus Uh, this uh, we also found excellent parasitation by this, and apart from that, we also have other uh, uh, microbial pathogens and EPN. So we have found out that uh, Bacillus thuringiensis we have used uh, in uh, uh, maize, and this is the result which we have got in different places. We have found eighty-five percent decrease in uh, pest incidence again in different places. It varies from seventy uh, percent to eighty-eight percent. this we have validated in different places even in uh, the southern parts and a little above in the adjoining states also we have verified and this bt25 is very good and already we have uh, applied for the provisional registration for the management of alam evum with our uh, central insecticide board and uh, may hopefully we will get the registration soon apart from that we have also maintained maintaining Uh, many uh, many strains of metarhizium and as a play as well as viviria basiana we found one strain of uh, metarhizium and uh, uh, it is ma35 is very effective at the, at the rate of 5 g per liter at this rate of 1 to 10 to the power of 8 spores at 15 days interval we found in different places the infestation has drastically reduced it ranges from 55 to 80% so so Uh, in the uh, natural field conditions also we have observed uh, several uh, microbial pathogens including virus and e e this is uh, probably a new record but of course this we found there are uh, problems in uh, uh, um, uh, culturing them in the field and the other things of course <coughs> we found it is a viviria is natural occurrence we have found and this is the just the result you can see how much uh, Uh, larvae uh, infection with uh, different percentage we have found fungal pathogens almost 74 percent and including NPV all the natural incidence this is only in one plot uh, this is not in all the plots I don't know what are the reasons for that and the NPV infection we have found already it was mentioned in the earlier uh, presentations so what we have done is we have also done uh, uh, several trials using this NPV formulations and we also got very good results. and in uh, curry we got up to 70 68% and again in the rabi season we got up to 90% eight, almost 82% uh, reduction in the pest so uh, entomopathogenic nematodes of course we didn't find a natural infection infection but we have different strains we are maintaining and one particular strain it is nbaia 101 at the rate of 4 to 6 kg per hectare and uh, we have used two formulation this is uh, a vegetable powder and a granular formulation uh, so we found the damage is uh, whenever we are using it is very less and almost we got almost look 92% recovery and which is almost comparable to the uh, chemical that is uh, mm actin benzoate 94% so so it is almost equivalent to that and what we are always saying is uh, apply in the holes not the whole uh, plant we are not uh, advocating it's only whole application so this has given very good uh, control of falamiva so what we have done is we have taken from the best biological control agents 
and along with the pheromone and again the neem, we have made a small trial. Uh, it is almost 1.5 acre and in 2018-19, we have done this trial. So what we have done is pheromone traps for the mass trapping, we have used at the, at the rate of 10 traps per acre. Uh, immediately, uh, say almost like seven days after the uh, transplantation, 20 days after transplantation, and uh, we have observed that the moth uh, oviposition by the moth is very much reduced when you have used the pheromone traps. And again, we started releasing trichogroma at the rate of 10, up to 1 lakh per acre. And again, uh, we have used four traps, uh, four releases at weekly, weekly intervals. And one spray of neem oil. So what we have taken, <coughs> we have also educated the farmers. Suppose if you are spraying, you have to wait for a week to release the trichogroma. <coughs> and again, we also used, when the larval stages are there, we have educated uh, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis 2% spray, one spray at uh, 15 days uh, interval after uh, 50 days after the neem was given. And uh, so sometimes we also used metarisium, as I told you, the strain MA35, five grams per liter. So we have got excellent result in the earlier stages. You can see this is the plot, control plot, where it is not untreated, it is only treated with some chemicals or whatever the farmers were ad advocating. But this is our IPM trial. So we can see how much, this is almost 15 to 20 days ahead of this one. Uh, in terms of the plant growth, in, in terms of the yield and other things. So this is uh, in uh, Gauri Bidhanur area. This is one of the places. So this is the data. So here we can see the number of uh, eggs per plant uh, after 30 days. So here we can control our farmer's practice as well as in the IPM control. We can see the gr gr drastic reduction in the pest. And again, this is uh, 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 the number of larvae. This is in terms of the egg masses. So both the data indicate that wherever we have used the biointensive pest management, the pest is drastically reduced. So taking cue from this, we have gone for a larger plot trail. Now at present it is going on. Almost like 70 acres in two villages, uh, we have taken the same in, in treatments are uh, imposed on these trials. We have got very good results. So of course we are waiting for the harvest detail and other details. Uh, so, but it has given encouraging results. So we, we are going ahead with that. So this clearly indicates we don't need much of chemical spraying. So this is uh, the, uh, uh, in conclusion, so first thing is initially you may have difficulty in getting the natural enemies, but later, uh, as I, I told you, within a two years, we found a good number of natural enemies in this. So natural parasitization of egg larvae is there. And sometimes we can say also metarhizium relay, what is earlier known as pneumuria relay is in certain packets. And uh, uh, what we have also said is, even with one or two sprays of neem with this biocontrol agents, we could prove that this pest can be easily controlled. And one advice is do not abandon the crop, do not use or overuse the synthetic insecticides. In this uh, situation, I also want to in inform that the biocontrol man based pest management doesn't work for the sweet uh, corn or baby corn. The uh, basic reason is that farmers uh, invest so much for the purchase of seeds because the cost of seed is very high, especially for the sweet corn and baby corn. So it is almost like 20,000 rupees per hectare, uh, per kg or so. So they don't want to use lose any one single plant. Say so they don't want to use this but uh, 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 India, we are able to manage with some of the chemicals. Of course, government uh, already has, uh, government of India has recommended four chemicals for this. Uh, with that chemicals, as well as metarhizium anisopilae also is one of the recommendations. So with all these recommendations, we are able to manage this pest very effectively. Of course, uh, in the future years, maybe another one or two years, it may not be a big issue for India. And of course, what we need is mass production units. Just uh, we are trying to establish with the help of some uh, big organizations, uh, at least in the farmers level production units so that the uh, local needs can be met by the farmers. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you all of you for giving uh, the opportunity to present and thank you very much. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Uh, so this is this this was a spectacular uh, presentation. Eh? So it, it really shows the potential of biological control, uh, IPM as well. And I think if there were still some uh, some people doubting about biological control, you got them convinced uh, today. Yes, yes. Now we go from India uh, to you. to China. So thank you very much. So Zheng Ying is a uh, he's at CAS at China Academy of Agricultural Sciences. And he's an expert in maize pest, pest management. And uh, so he's been working uh, a lot on fall army worm uh, recently. And that's what he will talk about you know, right now. Yes, so we enough. see your presentation. We hear you. Excellent. You, okay, you thank go you. Ahead, ben Ying. Yes, thank you, Chris. Now, uh, good afternoon. Now, I agree with the standard innovations in form of IPM and ballot control in China. Uh, have uh, for four parts. I'll give you more uh, information. The actions for farm emission after in, uh, in China. Yeah, before the farm emission in the uh, end of the 2018, the national uh, training course is uh, organized by the net task for the officials and technicians from the provincial plant protection stations is already uh, hired. So that identification and action should be taken if the four ammo in with China. And also in the end of the 2018, the Department of Culture, Mara, and also the notification to Department of Culture and Rural Affairs of Guangxi and the Yunnan provinces, and to threaten the mountain and early warning for farm. And also in the early of the January 2019, also the notification for provision of the farm also was also released by the NETESC. Because the farm observed on 11th January 2019, in Yunnan province, since then, the searching light tribes, black tribes, and all sex farm tribes for armor population dynamics mounting were set up in Yunnan, Guangxi, and Guangdong provinces, where the winter corn growing in January, and then the whole countries as the uh, spring corn city in the falling masses also set up. And also in the early, or, uh, in the middle of the January, Professor Wu, the vice president of a case, organized a workshop for four arm issues. And also the research groups were set up following the following the topics like the mountain and the early morning, chemical control, biological control, control techniques, bed, bed, and also light tracks utilization of the resistant variety and also emergency control techniques. As a February, a method for forecast and survey for farm already is released by the NATESC. In the early of the May, expert seminars organized by the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs of China focus on the current trade analysis and also control strategies. And also two national video conferences organized by the Ministry of Culture and Rural Affairs of China. The first one in the late of the May is mainly at that time for arrangement for the four arm control. And then in the middle of the July, another national video conference is organized by MERA the minister attended the conference and that made for the implementation for farm control. And also the many field demonstrations, training courses for farm around in China. This one is a national uh, is a field demonstration training for farm monitoring and control techniques at the provincial protection station level is late of the May by the NATESC. And the Ministry of Cultural Sciences, uh, of Culture. Uh, 
you see my screen? Yes, yeah, yeah. So just a, I'll just uh, indicate that to Zheng Jing. So Zheng Jing, okay. we'll, we'll first give the talk of Alison and after Alison's talk, we'll try again to, to get you connected from Beijing. Al Alison, please go ahead. Great, and I, I'm sandwiched between two uh, amazing presentations. Uh, the previous presentation was uh, fantastic, and I know Zen Ying will also give a fantastic presentation, having uh, had him um, participate in our biocontrol series. So you're in for um, two great presentations there. So I hope I can just give a very brief overview of what we are doing on biocontrol in our program of work under the ASEAN Action Plan. So I'm just going to um, say that we actually have a flagship project that will focus on biocontrol opportunities within um, IPM. Uh, and it is aiming to develop capacity for improving the capability and use of biocontrol across the ASEAN region. Um, but it's, of course, biocontrol is not just in its own program. It's also inserted uh, in other projects that we're running, like the Regional Resistance Management Plan, the Technology Transfer, and the Regional Innovation and Knowledge Hub. So it's really uh, incorporated right across our program. Uh, some of you, I think actually quite a few of you may have been involved uh, or participated in our biocontrol webinar series that we just ran. Uh, we had three webinars, one on classical biocontrol and an introduction, biopesticides and webinar three was around augmentation uh, and conservation. And uh, it was extremely successful. We had over 1,400 people register, 700, 700 plus attend, and we've already had over 900 views of the recordings. And I think um, just with the amount of information that was exchanged and discussed, uh, there's very good resources there for people to watch. There's a huge amount um, of information and a lot of really good presentations. So if you haven't seen them so far, please uh, click on the links um, or I can send you the links as well. And I just want to emphasize that what we found throughout this series is that there's significant groups of expertise and interest in the region already. And we feel this needs to really be better linked so that these researchers and practitioners can work together more and potentially access larger funds and projects. And, and that's very much of what we've discussed today in, in this uh, more wider regional um, meeting. So it's really good to hear that. Um, to note, we'll be posting further resources from this series, such as the presentation PDFs, Q&A documents on our soon to be published knowledge, Innovation and Knowledge Hub. So that will be a central point of information sharing for us on the ASEAN Action Plan. Uh, and we're really keen um, to share those resources. So please take a look. Um, the work doesn't stop there though, so what I wanted to give you is just a bit of a taster of what we're going to be uh, launching very soon. Um, we are going, we're going to run an eight session plus technical workshop series over the next six months. We're doing this in collaboration with CABI, uh, but also the IPM Innovation Lab, and we're interested in other partners. So if you are interested in sharing some of your work, um, noting that this is a very practical technical workshop uh, series. So you'll see we're looking at sessions around effective biopesticide trials, right through to production of biopesticides, rearing of parasitoids and predators, and also looking at farmer acceptance of biocontrol approaches, which was something that was brought up quite a lot actually in our biocontrol series, is how do we um, encourage farmers and, and make them feel comfortable with using um, biocontrol uh, approaches in the field. So that's very exciting. You'll see that's actually a lot planned. Um, so we're really uh, in the thick of it now, planning all those sessions. So please contact me if you're interested in, in, um, in those sessions, either as a, an attendee or uh, if you're interested in um, potentially partnering with us. Uh, and thirdly, we are developing a full biocontrol program. So we'll be looking at um, how do we build that capability across education, research and technology transfer. Importantly, looking at the regulatory environment because this is really important. It's not just about having uh, a whole lot of tools, uh, biocontrol tools and choices, but making sure that they can actually be used and scaled up within countries. And I think that's something that needs to be given um, some further thought on how we 
make that process smoother uh, and field application and working with farmers, of course. So that's a big program that we are starting. Um, so uh, again, please contact us if you're interested in um, working on that with us. Um, and that really just underscores that last point there that we really welcome working with countries and stakeholders across Asia Pacific, not just in Southeast Asia. And that's my brief, uh, very brief uh, presentation. I just wanted to give you a taster. And I also know that you've got a very detailed and exciting presentation coming up. Um, so I'm going to uh, give it back to you, Chris. Yep. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, great to, to hear the news about the ongoing biological control uh, seminar series. I think that's going to that's going to be very interesting for all participants to 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 take part in as well. Yeah, uh, and you're, you're see... very welcome. You're very welcome for anyone to join that as well. So we run a very open policy. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Very, very good, Alison. Oh, a great, great work hap happening with that with that seminar series. Uh, Great, thank you. So we we would go to the last talk of the of the of the day, and that's a talk by uh, Dr. Malvika Chodhari. Uh, she works with Kabi in New Delhi, India, and she has over 20 years of working experience in the field of biological control of crop pests and pathogens. She has ample research experience on weed biological control, behavioral. Ecology and tritrophic interactions of insects, primarily as related to the use of symbiochemicals as behavior modifying substances. Her work covers research, production, quality control, regulatory affairs of microbial pesticides and pheromones. She is further involved as a regional trainer in Asia for uh, training of extension staff on the utilization of biological control. Malvika uh let's see if you're able to connect the so thank you very much chris thank you for a very kind introduction and good afternoon everybody uh so i'm malvika chaudhry and currently working as plantwise regional coordinator for asia i'm working with cabbie as chris said uh so i've been uh, like i feel very privileged to uh, present a summary of cabbie initiatives which were presented in cab uh, the grow asia cabbie webinar which Alison was just talking about. Next slide, please. Uh, so like uh, how we have been talking throughout the day that implementation of bio-based IPM strategy is really important. And CABI is partnering with the various uh, partners in the region uh, to drive uh, certain initiatives which are supporting like uh, conservation, making environment conducive for biocontrol agent, uh, working with partners to strengthen monitoring and undertaking pest management efforts. But like how few of my former uh, speakers said that to create awareness is really important. And in my presentation, I would be presenting how we are working with the partners and last but not the least collaboration across the region. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, like monitoring is really important because if we are able to assess the damage right at the beginning, then the biocontrol becomes really effective. And uh, to strengthen this part of the activity uh, in uh, Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia, so particularly in Pakistan, we are uh, following the ISPM 6, uh, which is for surveillance and 8, which is for pest status with Department of Plant Protection, and we are currently conducting surveys to understand the region where the pest is present. Similarly, like um, uh, molecular characterization has been emphasized because there are two strains and it is also seen uh, that some of the uh, uh, emerging strains are there in the region. So monitoring coupled with the molecular characterization is being done currently in India, Philippines and with CESRO Australia. Uh, Jean got, uh, gave a very good presentation on FAMUS, and we are very happy to say that with FAO in Bangladesh, we are uh, training the extension officers on FAMUS and also bringing a automated solar-based pheromone trapping system for the e-surveillance in the country. So in the ASEAN region, uh, under our flagship program, PlantWise, uh, we are linking, uh, there are discussions in the countries like Vietnam, Myanmar, and Cambodia. Uh, to uh, work 
uh, under our program called PRICE, which is Best Risk uh, Information Services, and then getting the earth information and the dynamic sources uh, layered together for the pest forecasting. So uh, under the same program, the form management is also envisaged. Next presentation, next slide, please. Chris, can I have the next slide, please? Yes, but it's, it's something is not happening here. <laughs> it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Well, now I cannot move the slides. Yeah, I, I, I cannot move your slides anymore. Somehow uh, I... Do. Not in slide. I'm sorry. Yeah, because... Yeah, I cannot, I cannot do anything. Everything is stuck here in my computer. Yeah, because uh, these are, I mean to say, <laughs> this was a simple presentation. I don't understand probably yeah. what's uh, going uh, wrong out Malvika, there. I will, stop, I will stop sharing and then I will share again. I think something is stuck maybe with Zoom. Yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, just a second. I'm sharing. I'm so sorry again. about this, but yes. Yeah, yeah. let's see. Yeah. Let's see if we can get this fixed. Yeah. Okay. There you go again. Okay. Great. Sorry. Great. Uh, so, yeah. So, continuing with this, uh, these are the biological control approaches, which the forms speakers have spoken, so I will not too much emphasize on these, but just to say we're really working on and uh, Chris. Hello. Chris, can I have the next slide? Please? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Chris, can we have the next slide, please? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. We didn't hear you. <laughs> So classical biological control is much more about collaboration. That is definite because uh, it, it, where, where the uh, exotic parasitoids are uh, emerged or are known from, that is the origin, uh, or that is the area of their origin to the country where the, they have to be introduced. There has to be a very good collaborative work to introduce these exotic organisms. So we need to work a lot with the plant protection wings and the plant quarantine wings, and then understand how we can assess the risk and to quarantine um, and then study before we release it to them. Once the um, exotic um, organism uh, is proven, then it is uh, very good to release them in the field. And uh, they are having huge benefits to the farmer because the subsequent release, there is no subsequent release because the natural enemy established itself in the fields. Next slide, please. So presently, uh, CABI uh, is working uh, in classical biological control and there are two parasitoids uh, which are named over here. One is Chilonus insularis and the other is Ephesoma. So these two parasitoids uh, have been brought from the uh, Latin America, and uh, they have been extensively studied uh, in, uh, in CABI Switzerland office. And um, uh, now uh, they have been uh, shipped and uh, studied under the quarantine in Africa and Asia as well. We can take advantage of these ongoing projects, but we still need to investigate uh, what are the specifications uh, of Southeast Asia whether the native parasitoids that are already present in the region are uh, a better biocontrol agent, are they attacking fall armyworm, uh, whether these exotic uh, biocontrol agents uh, have a potential to become a pest on the non-target effect on uh, native species. We also need to uh, focus on the climate matching of both the regions and see whether these uh, organisms will be able to establish themselves in the area of uh, introduction uh, simultaneously seeing the regulation and the quarantine facility in the country of introduction. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, just coming to the IPN tool, uh, one is classical biological control and then 
uh, like uh, in the ICAR presentation by Dr. Bakfaslam was showing that EPN can be really effective uh, as a biocontrol agent. So CABI is focusing a lot on the formulation aspect of it because the um, uh, application is a challenge. And then uh, we are happy to say that we had a lot of good uh, successful feed trials when we use the gel-based formulation of entomopathogenic nematodes against the fall army worm. So this can be a powerful tool in the IPM toolkit. Next slide, please. Uh, here I would like to give an example from Myanmar because uh, this is just an effort under the PlantWise program um, wherein my colleague, uh, Dr. Arno is seen over here because here we have uh, um, kind of uh, under the four uh, under the fostering agricultural revitalization in Myanmar, which we, in short, we call farm, we had like participatory learning plot approaches uh, in those regions where the farmer practices were giving uh, more than 90% of uh, losses were seen and where the spray frequency was going as high as eight times in three months. So um, under the farm project, uh, we had uh, done these demonstration plots in which we had biopesticides like BT were used uh, in conjunction with pheromone traps and the other complementary technologies. And we could clearly see that the IPM in IPM yield uh, around 3,000 marketable years were found as, per, as compared to the uh, conventional farmer practices where the number of years harvested was less. And and there was a marginal increase in the net revenue as compared to both the fields. Uh, so this had uh, actually led to reduced spray of the hard pesticides that the farmers were really using. And with the two, uh, two sprays of emamectin benzoate and four sprays of BT, uh, this kind of result was obtained. Next slide, please. So uh, I totally agree uh, when we say that the farmer's acceptance is really important. So to assess the farmer's uh, acceptance and why the utilization is so low uh, uh, in spite of such potential biocontrol agents present, uh, CABI took up these two studies where when you see the references of these two studies, which are an open access uh, paper and very interesting to read, we could find that uh, definitely big awareness campaign is needed if we need to promote the utilization of biocontrol because the farmer don't realize the risk of conventional pesticides and they are not aware of biologicals. Biologicals are treated as conventional pesticides and thus the education uh, about biocontrol agents is really required at farm level. So um, somewhere the biologicals are not available. And even if they are available, the extension officers are not giving the advice to use the biocontrol agents. So this is a lacunae which needs to be overcome. Next slide, please. Uh, so to fill in this gap, uh, we uh, have worked uh, in the region, like in countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar and Cambodia, etc., where, wherein we have developed with the partners manuals because with the FAO, we already have developed uh, some uh, manuals for the officers, extension officers, and the farmers. So, same have been customized for the um, countries and have been disseminated. And then there are some mass extension tools which have been developed, like leaflets, posters, and video, which uh, would have been uh, given through the training workshops. Uh, so there are some radio messages which have been uh, again uh, produced with the help of the uh, agriculture information services in the country. And uh, they are planned to be broadcasted through community radios. Social media is becoming very, very popular. So this media has also adopted for uh, raising the awareness on fall armyworm and the biological control. Because of the COVID scenario, though the face-to-face -face, um, uh, workshops and uh, dissemination uh, uh, is becoming really difficult, but then we have, uh, uh, following out plan B, we could get the, them on virtual platform and some of these uh, messages and the tools are being used. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so as I said, the collaboration is really important and uh, we are very happy that uh, we are uh, leading the four, uh, fall army worm research collaboration portal. And uh, as you see, it is really important for the information uh, to come out in open where the biocontrol agents are present. So we encourage the researchers to put in the information on a crowdsource table where uh, the success and even failures are recorded by various researchers. So in case you can get hold of this portal and you can get information which have been successful and which have failed. So it can uh, not only support your research, but it can also help in disseminating very important information. Next slide, please. This is another tool to uh, kind of make uh, the farmers uh, or the extension officers aware uh, where the uh, products are available. So Cabi is coming up uh, with the bioprotection portal, which would uh, help in understanding the availability. Next slide, please. So if I am a farmer or an extension officer, and I know my combination of the crop and pest, uh, and here in this case, fall army worm, uh, so I can just get that combination and then understand uh, which are the biocontrol agents or biopesticides which are present uh, in this particular area, uh, which are the agro dealers uh, who are um, uh, having these uh, products available on their shelves uh, and other important uh, information like the material sector, the safety data sheets, etc. are also the part of the portal. I think I've come to the last slide now. There's, so Chris, can we have that? Uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, just to uh, have a kind of brainstorming, we are talking about biocontrol agents, but we need to also think about the smallholder farmers to whom we are recommending these biocontrol agents. So very important for us to understand is, does it work or does it reduce the losses uh, which the farmers are currently undergoing? And uh, what does our uh, regulatory uh, uh, system says about the safety and the international standards, guidelines, et cetera? Is it practical or easy to use? And do we have these gender considerations and that our main beneficiaries are small holders? So how practical it is for them? Is it really cost? effective. And lastly, but uh, very importantly, we, um, as a lot of groups, uh, should come together to work on this. As uh, one of my, the former speakers said, this small army worm is just because it is a transboundary pest. So we need to work as a region. And this is really important for the management of the small army worm, especially when we are uh, considering biocontrol as an option. So thank you very much, Chris. That is the last slide that I have. And thank you uh, for the attention. And I don't know, but if there are any questions, I would like to. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Malvika. Very good presentation from Kabi uh, in India. Ex excellent, excellent work. We can tackle some of the questions. Um, maybe we can have a Q&A session of, of just 10 minutes or five minutes, and then we can wrap up at 4.30 PM. So let's see. Um, I have a question for Wilma. So Wilma, I have a question about the trap plants. Uh, what crops are preferred by fall armyworm and can they be established in the edge of the field? The professor that uh, we just had the fall armyworm last June 2019 and all our strategies are invalidated. Mm -hmm. So I cannot conclude yet which is uh, really what variety of plant is really good for trapping fall armyworm. Yeah, very, very good, Wilma. Excellent. Um, let's see, I have a question for Ivan. Ivan, are you with us still? Uh, yes, Dr. Chris. Yes, Ivan, I have a question. I forgot from who it is. I didn't write it down, but uh, the question goes like, could you please share experience on solar UV light? Does it attract natural enemies? And what percent capture of Falarmi worm do you get? How good is it to capture Falarmi worm? And does it attract natural enemies? Those are the questions. Uh, actually, the, uh, uh, 
the uh, solar light trap is uh, attract uh, both male and female of form armyworm and some other lepidoptera. So uh, that is an that's only an observation, uh, Dr. Chris. So this might be a uh, uh, further studies for that uh, particular uh, uh, tool. Yeah. Oh, okay, Ivan. So further work is needed to make sure how much how how good it works to to catch fall army worm. And uh, I I think it probably attracts some natural enemies, but we maybe we don't know yet what natural enemies and and how much. Yeah. Uh, yes, Dr. Chris. Yeah, that's a that's very good, Ivan. Um, I have a question for uh, the team at ICAR, uh, Dr. Bakta Bakta Vatsalam. Um, could you please explain more about the process to make name essential oil? How do you make the essential oil? Which part of the fruit do you use? And how do you press it? And how do you extract the, 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 the oil? Uh, actually, there are so many uh, processing industries are available in India. So usually they use the uh, seed kernel you know, neem fruit will be very uh, yellow color and inside you will get the kernel. And from that kernel only oil is extracted. And uh, uh, so there only you will get more uh, content of azadirectin. So of course, uh, it's a big process. If you can write to my email, I'll give you the process. Alternatively in India, so many companies are uh, producing and uh, uh, selling, marketing and even exporting. So you can also try to import. So that is no problem. So it is commercially available. Uh, otherwise also I can give you the procedure of extracting neem oil from the neem seed kernel. Yeah. Yes. Very good. E excellent. Thank you yes. very much. Uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, I have several questions for Jean-Claude, but I think Jean-Claude left already and answered the questions on online. Um, so people who, who want to see the answers, they just would have to go to the chat or the Q&A a, a box. Um, I have a question for Buyung. Buyung, are you with us? See what's written in the chat box. I'm here, Chris. Hey, Buyung. Uh, I have a question about uh, the economic threshold. I, I think, uh, so the person, based on, on what both you and I pre presented, I think the person wanted a little bit more information about what is an economic threshold. Uh, uh, could, could you explain me very short what the economic threshold is or? or uh... Sure, sure, sure. So, so the economic threshold is, is the classical way that entomologists uh, sort of bring together um, to guide uh, interventions such as spray of pesticides. It is called economic threshold because the idea is to inject into the, uh, the decision uh, some economic considerations that you, we shouldn't spray when it doesn't make economic sense. And uh, this is why I, I mentioned that uh, there are quite a number, there, there is actually a formal um, equations to this. It's a that take into account uh, the relationship between the injury and yield loss, uh, the farm gate price, uh, and also the cost of the I hope, hope that's broad enough, Chris. Yeah, I think that's very, very good, Buyung. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, the economic value of the crop loss equals the cost of your pesticide-based interve yes, intervention. Yes, huh? yes. So simple, simple terms. Very simple. Uh, yeah, very, very good, Buyung. I, I think that that hopefully that addresses the, the question from the, the participants uh, side. Um, then I have a whole set of questions for me, many, many, many questions for me. So can we use IPM for tuta absoluta? Uh, absolutely. See, so you, using the same word, word as tuta absoluta, absolutely. Uh, we can use IPM for any and every pest and cropping system. Uh, the principles are the same. Uh, so pesticides as the measure of last resort, preventative approaches such as cultural control, uh, uh, manual control, agroecological tactics as the first line of defense. 
and conserving biodiversity as much as we can. And I think that holds in any and every cropping system for any and every pest. Uh, um, then uh, I have a question about insect radar technology. How can we use it? Is it feasible at the field level? Um, so insect radar technology uses the same, the exactly same, uh, uh, um, yeah, principles or, te or technologies as any uh, ra radar technology. So it, it detects uh, movement in, in, in the air. And for insect radar, it's based on wing beat frequency. So they can, I they can uh, identify an insect. They, they can detect a flying insect based on the movement and the mass of the insect. And then based upon uh, based upon the wing beat frequency, they can identify uh, the, the, the species of, in, of insect. This technology has been refined uh, in a number of locations, but here in, in Asia for Fall Army worm specifically, there's a lot of work being done in, uh, in CAS in, in Beijing. Uh, so it, for the people who want more information, more details on that, I would, I would suggest uh, you reach out to, to the team in, in Beijing, and that includes Zengying Wang as, as well. Let's see if I have maybe one more question and then we'll call it a day. Uh, a question for Wilma again. Wilma, are you still there? Yes. Yes, yeah. Uh, so the question is how to fix organic bait traps? Uh, how efficient are those organic baits and how do they compare? How does their efficacy or their attractiveness compare to pheromone lures? So actually, what we're using now are the commercial pheromone lure and those that are uh, organic bait traps, uh, we will just test it first because we're just really for our strategies, almost all our uh, strategies are for validation. So we don't have yet any conclusion in which is which. Yeah. Okay. So we, we need we need more work. We need to validate that a little bit more. Uh, very very good. But I think the Vietnamese people, let's say, if Mr. Fong is still with us, I think in Vietnam they have very good experiences with bait traps. Mm. Yes, I'm here, great. Hi everyone. Oh, yeah, Mr. Fong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do Do you want to tell something about bait traps? <coughs> about sweet and sour traps close uh, sugar um uh what i think uh, sugar and um water um oh i forgot a moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah or or, um, or 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 just if you tell us yeah do they attract a lot of fall army worms yes. or not more than pheromone traps or less yeah um, uh, uh, molasses by trap uh, um, very, very easy to make by, by a farmer, uh, but um, molasses trap uh, must be uh, put on the field uh, a lot, uh, more, more, lot, much more than pheromone um, uh, traps. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the farmer can uh, make it so uh, that's easy to, to, to use a lot on uh, the field. Um, and uh, we in uh, Vietnam, uh, we, uh, we 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 try uh, we we uh, we make or some um, some some, uh, some, uh, some some try few uh, in in um, um, it's in uh, Denmark, uh, and uh, we I I saw that um, we can use uh, more strap uh, to um, uh, to control the. Oh, that's a uh, form of worm on the field. It's the first time of um, crops, uh, they make crop. And uh, of course, uh, pheromone traps is uh, better than um, molasses trap. Uh, but uh, the farmer, um, uh, uh, most of the farmer, uh, they cannot buy uh, pheromone traps. And um, at this time in uh, Vietnam, PPD uh, suggests uh, for farmer use uh, molasses trap. Uh, to control for everyone uh, the first time. Yeah, very good. <coughs> yeah, very very good, Mr. Fong. Very yeah. e e excellent intervention. Yeah, and uh, last time I 
um, uh, I make a clip to guide the, uh, how to make the molasses, molasses for farmer. Yeah, that, yeah, that would yeah. be helpful. So the the, the, yeah. the people that ask this question, then they can have a, uh, some detailed instructions. Um, maybe one last question for Ivan, and and then we close. It's a uh, is fall army worm in the Philippines attacking rice paddies? Yeah, it will have saved. Rice, uh, but a yeah. yeah, rice and uh, some uh, other plant, but no on rice about one hundred uh, hectare in uh, some province, yeah. in the north, in the middle, and in the south. Uh, but uh, the, the density is low density on the right. Uh, and and uh, over one time in uh, in, in, in point. So it is about, at this province, uh, we, uh, we, we found family worm uh, damage on the right. But uh, next time, I, I didn't see again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't understand. I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it's only in certain. Uh, Doctor Chris, oh. I want to just uh, interact in this uh, aspect of uh, calling us, say, alternate hosts or something like this. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. See, problem is most of the people. Maybe some, some, sometimes the larvae will have some little bit of feeding or nibbling, but we don't consider as a alternate host that crop. Unless it completes its life cycle, we cannot call it as an alternate host. But in uh, fall armyworm, as you know, there are two strains. One is corn strain and rice strain. So rice strains, there is chances that it will happen. Because here in India, we have analyzed. We saw that the majority is corn strain, but even rice strain also exists. So that kind of strain analysis may have to be done. Yeah, very good. Excellent, uh, excellent intervention. And I thank you, thank to, you. To clar clarify about the strains. Yeah, yeah. excellent. So maybe we can wrap things up. So I'd, I would like to thank all the speakers, uh, all the panelists for excellent uh, contributions. I, I, I think there were some issues with with the microphone in, in Bangkok. And, and then, yeah, may, maybe we lost Zeng Ying, maybe due to poor poor uh, Wi-Fi or internet connectivity in, in, in Beijing. Uh, but uh, I, I think very, very good contributions, excellent presentations, very comprehensive work in all the different countries. I'm, I'm sure also comprehensive management responses in China, although we didn't hear the details. Um, uh, I, in addition to thanking the panelists, I would also like to thank the participants, the audience itself. I saw that in uh, right now we still have 40 attendees. At, at some point in time, we had 45 or almost 50 attendees. So I think this is a very good turnout. Um, uh, and then uh, in addition to thanking attendees and uh, panelists, I, I, I have a, a, a yeah, a, a, a warm thank, thank you for Marut uh, at the Thai Educational Foundation for making all this happen. Uh, and to, uh, uh, to uh, Yubak in, uh, in Bangkok for facilitating this event. Uh, so this was the first of, uh, of three uh, webinars. The next one is next week, Tuesday, uh, November 3, again at the same time. And again, with uh, excellent uh, pre presenters and, and, and hopefully or, or surely uh, uh, engaging discussions. So thank you, everybody, uh, for participating and looking forward uh, to uh, your presence next Tuesday when you will be in the hands of uh, two other people. So I will be there, but you, you likely will not see much of me. Yeah? So have a nice rest of the day, rest of the day, and a nice evening here in Southeast Asia, and uh, see you next week.